What's interesting is I, I wanted to start by telling you that when I first uh, came here yesterday and saw all of you, I was meeting a few of you and I said, uh, I'm actually not, uh, I don't do what you do. And then I realized that I did what you do 10 years ago uh, when I wrote a story um, I fleshed out um, an entire world uh, with a language and uh, a culture, and that's what you do. So I guess I am one of you. So I feel very proud to say that. And I would say that in my language, world first. It looks like this. There's basically uh, world first is one, which is a common uh, phrase that's said uh, on that planet. Okay, um, today I'm going to talk to you about how a, uh, how creative language or created part of language, the alphabet, uh, uh, actually it's called the Latin one-handed alphabet, and how that became a part of a language, uh, American Sign Language. This is a, uh, this is a, image from a booklet that was uh, written in 1593, uh, actually it was published in 1593, the, the man Yebra, the, uh, the monk actually had passed away, another monk with the same name, named after the monk that uh, he was following, um, actually made the publication occur and uh, in honor of the man, although apparently he did pay uh, Yeber, the original Yeber, did pay for the images to be created. Um, and then 27 years later, uh, his work basically was ripped off by another man named Juan Pablo Bonet, who um, took uh, Yeber's original hand shapes and uh, added a few to them because his only covered uh, Latin, um, and he needed a few more, so he added a couple. And he did a pretty nice job, actually, of um, you know cleaning up the art, having it redone. Uh, then he, he wrote an entire book about how to teach deaf people. Um, and that's really his contribution to deaf education in general. Um, although in the book, he never uh, once mentions where he got the handshapes from, interestingly. So now we're still in Spain, then we go to France. Um, I don't speak French, so I'm going to slaughter this uh, man's name. Uh, his name's basically Epe, which uh, means uh, the sword, if I'm correct. Um, and the sign for his name looks like this. <laughs> anyway, uh, he was a monk who, you know, monks hang together, so he had a book, this, this book from Bonnet, uh, that was written a hundred years earlier. He took that book and he met a couple of deaf twins and uh, with the deaf twins signs that he learned, which would, we, we would call now home signs. So he took home signs from these two deaf girls and uh, this book full of uh, these handshapes and he started teaching deaf kids. And that is really when people say that um, a language is, was born when all of that came together and new people were being added to this, um, this little language group. Well, about another hundred years later, um, we have uh, France to the United States with uh, Thomas Gallaudet and a guy named Laurent Claire who was deaf. Uh, they came over. Uh, Claire actually was giving a presentation in London when uh, Gallaudet was visiting London it, it was completely by happenstance that he heard of this exhibition that was occurring. He went there, saw this guy, and said, wow, I want to learn what you're doing because the people here in England are, uh, the people who teach deaf people in England aren't letting me learn how to do that. And uh, Claire said, well, come to France. We'll teach you everything you want to know. And so basically, the reason why we have American Sign Language, the way it looks now in the United States, is because um, the British didn't want to help Gallaudet and the French did. So not only help, this guy actually came with them on a boat back to the United States, and they started a school. Now getting back to fingerspelling, um, I don't know if I, I didn't point this out, but I will. I think it's very cute. Look here, 
they even put uh, on the cuff a nice little B. Isn't that cute? Um, years later, they actually uh, used the same thing in cufflinks. Isn't that nice? <laughs> so we're talking 1886 for this image. And here's what it looks like in 1910. Sorry about the sound. You can't see the guy very well, but he is fingers burning. Oh, you can't see him at all. Sorry. He's going all the way across uh, the, the field of the film, actually, to make this happen. This, this isn't a very good example for you. It's a great example for my work from 1910. We'll, we'll keep going. So um, if, a, if a language or a, uh, a conlang has been through four countries and, been, and has been used as a component in a language for over 400 years, what can we guess about that? What's going to happen to it? It's going to change. That's exactly right. It's going to change. People are smart. It's going to change. <laughs> and so it's very interesting to me that here is an example of what it looked like um, in 1593. And here's what it looked like in 2013. OK, wait a minute. It looks almost the same. Very little has changed of these two exemplars, at least. So here's what it's like. I'm going to make another video, by the way. Um, how do you want me to tell you that? I'm just going to wait a few more on it. This is what it's like uh, as far as the rules go for, for deaf people. The first rule of Fight Club is you do not talk about Fight Club. The second rule of Fight Club is you do not talk about Fight Club. <laughs> so you get the idea that um, for whatever reason, deaf people don't discuss um, why they do something different. Uh, they just maintain the, uh, the look or the belief that they are doing something that's the same, but indeed they're doing something drastically different than um, what they lead you to believe. So another metaphor would be that this is what they use, um, and this is what <laughs> hearing people get <laughs> as far as the set of tools. So David, when you were trying to learn finger spelling, this was the problem. It's, it's absurd. It's totally absurd, and I don't understand why more people aren't talking about how absurd it is. I, 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 it, it, it. Yeah, um, Matt agrees, and you know, Matt and I were like this. But, um, I want to back up a step two and explain that uh, words and letters are not the same thing. You know that. You know a lot about language and linguistics, so. This group would absolutely know that, but for the one or two people who may not understand that, I'm going to beat this into your head. I'm going to say that even us, even linguists, have been inculcated with the concept that A is a word, or excuse me, is a letter. But indeed, A is a word in English for the written thing that we write, and the only way we can say that is to use a word. So, of course, we know that. So W, in my opinion, is the greatest example of this because it's two words, W, right, W. Unless you live in Texas, then it's W. w. And that is one word, however, you get my point. So the clearest uh, comparison that I can make for you is to say that finger spelling is like what I would call speech spelling, which is basically, uh, let me do this for you. Um, S H A Z B A T or B O T or um, B A Z I N G A. <laughs> so I can do this and you understand what the word is, but I'm doing it actually in American Sign Language Finger Spelling and in English uh, using a parallel system. I can, oh, excuse me, I, I C A N A L S O D O T H I S I F Y O U W A N T M E T O. C A N Y O U N D E R S T A N D N E T H A T B E C A U S C Y O U A R E C O N L A N G U E R S M O O N E C A N U N D E R S T A N D M E. However, I can't do that. I cannot mouth spell or um, uh, 
speak spell as speech spell as fast as I can finger spell. My my fingers can move faster than I can make each individual word appear for each individual letter. So that I, I, I'm trying to uh, help explain that the reason why finger spelling in a perfect form is cumbersome is because you're talking about a bunch of words put together. And then when we talk about things like um, assimilation, what are we talking about? Uh, like think about U-N-D-E-R-S-T-A-N-D. -E when I do that, when we talk about assimilation, we're talking about the sounds that are at the ending of each word. We're not talking about the sound of one thing impacting the sound of something else. We're talking about a whole variety of sounds impacting a whole variety of sounds, right? And the same thing, the same kind of thing is occurring when people fingerspell. So it's highly complex. So my aha moment related to all this was, I learned to do this as a baby. My parents were deaf. I, it's my first language. It was easy for me. But my cousins who live in Iowa, who are, are farmers, don't understand fingerspelling at all. But when I was growing up, I thought that was strange. How stupid are they? They can't do something I could do from birth. It's not that hard. You just, you know, 26 things, come on. But the fact is, it's highly complex and highly difficult. So I stood back and I said, okay, what can I do to figure this out? And the best thing I could do is say, imagine I'm on another planet. Imagine I'm looking at something with completely new eyes and no one has ever seen before. Let's look to see what they're actually doing. And this is what they do. I'm slowing it way, way down. This is one-fourth speed. So E-V-E-R is what he's doing again and again. And I love digital technology because my arm would get tired doing this, but he never gets tired. He can just do this all day long. So you see these four things that he's doing. Now there's something called finger spelling space. I'm not going to bore you with a lot of uh, specific details, but it's about here, right? Is he staying in that space? No. So number one, you teach people, or I should say deaf people teach hearing people how to finger spell, and they tell them to stay in this space. And then they themselves don't. How nice is that? <laughs> well, another thing you may see if, um, okay, I want you to look at the second E that's coming up now. And again, now. Okay, you saw that. Now I'm going to let you see another one where he's saying F A N. Look at that N. Look at it again. F A N. Look at that N. Now remember those two and please look at this. Find them on this, on this little diagram, please. Find the E that I showed you and the N that I showed you. The E is there, but it's not the right E because the E that I showed you looked like this. And the end that I showed you looked like this. Can you turn on the lights, maybe? I, I'll leave them off. Oh, well, whatever. It's okay. <laughs> the end looked like this, and the E looked like this. And neither one of those are on this list. So you're out of luck. So if you want to understand what he said, I guess you have to be psychic. Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> So you have to um, go with me a little bit and um, understand that in American Sign Language Linguistics or in Sign Language Linguistics in general, for the purpose of understanding similar terms, we call um, smallest parts allophones, or excuse me, smallest parts without meaning phonemes, and then each individual um, expression of that an allophone, <coughs> even though uh, they're not sounds and they're not variations of sounds. So just for those of you who are purists in that sense, please just go with me on that. So the problem is 26? No, there are many more than 26. Um, to constrain it to the 26 that we think there are is actually quite uh, erroneous. We actually don't know how many there are yet. So take this concept of a mental construct and then you have a variation, natural variation that occurs. So you can have an E that doesn't quite touch you can have an E that touches, and you can have an E that's way wide, you can drive a truck through that space, right? 
It almost looks like a C. Well, these three variants are considered natural variation in the language, not a problem. In fact, um, they're taught to hearing people. Like, isn't that nice? They actually let you know what those are. Now, sometimes some people say this is wrong, but you know, you get variation in teachers as well. Now, here's a few that um, are very unusual. This is one that's supposed to happen after um, an M. This next one happens after a V. And the next one happens after an L. Now, if, if you know anything about ASL finger spelling, there's one thing that's interesting. What is this? X. Okay, now, it's possible that you could have two things that overlap, but would you want to do that with an alphabet? Probably not, right? Not a great idea. So, I'm not talking to you about what I would like them to do. I'm talking about what they actually do. So I looked for X, and I found something fascinating related to X, and I'm talking about it later, but for ease of the teachable moment, right? Um, I'll talk about it now. X actually looks like this in words like sex, facts, um, any X that, is X that is final looks like this or like this. So it's to the side or to the front. It's actually only in a situation where you're teaching the alphabet that you actually use X like this. So the fact is, users of the language actually pushed the one away from the other to make them more intelligible. Otherwise, it would be too confusing. Frankly, how many times do you say X anyway? But um, do you use X anyway? But the fact is, they uh, disambiguated that problem all on their own. Bob Johnson in 1995 uh, figured out those, or at least that's when he told us about it. I don't know uh, actually when he did it. He was a professor of college that retired a couple years ago. Now I've been finding quite a bit more, um, and it's not surprising that there are more. Uh, there are actually now 16 just for E. Um, and that's just E. There are many. So here are some of the new ones. And it goes on. I'm going to give you a few more examples so that you understand a little bit more about this. So some of these images are a little blurry, but go with me here. I'll redo them with my own hands so it's a little more clear. Um, here's a C. Okay, you can go with that. This is actually a variant of C because C is supposed to be like this. So if it's forward or C forward, um, that's already a variant. Now, it's a natural occurring variant. I mean, it's fairly um, common because most of the things that are finger spelled are done forward. So your palm is facing forward. So it's, it's likely that you're going to get this kind of thing to happen. So A, not very exciting. And then we have this N. OK, so we had fan that looked like this in fan the other day. And then now we have this one that looks like this. We still aren't getting this, which is supposed to be N, by the way, for those of you who don't know. And then here's a C. Now, wait a minute. Um, C is supposed to have all four of the fingers up, and this one only has two. Now, that's something I think that's a little bit fascinating. Then we have another C that now you can see it. This, uh, what I call this, I call this C2. And, and the, um, I'm sorry, C2 and E2. Because it uses um, two fingers. And then R. What's, what do you find interesting about this R? It's way down here. In fact, if you consider, this is the hardest position to actually see from a straight angle, right? You, you're actually seeing the least amount of my hand when I do this. Here's what it looks like if you do it all together quickly. Then that's how fast the language um, incorporates in your And I can document these happening 100 years ago in a film. So the same things that I'm finding now in users of the language who are living, I'm finding in users of the language from 100 years ago. So not that surprising, language changes. We keep finding more of these allophones. We'll be yay. But then things get a little weird. We start adding vocabulary to the alphabet.
That's a P, A, double Z, A, single Z. I love this example because I get both the double Z and the single Z in the same word. Yay! Or in the same string because in ASL fingerspelling, each one of those examples is a word in and of itself, right? And then you put them all together and it's a string of words. I know that's a little confusing perhaps, but... Okay, so double Z is a new sign in the American Sign Language alphabet. Isn't that great? So this lexicalization issue where it becomes a new word in the language seems very rigorous. Uh, it, it's very common for a word to then uh, be able to come up any time once it's already become lexicalized. Now CH is going to get me in some trouble unless you realize that we're not talking about the sound, but we're talking about what happens when a person makes a mouth shape that looks like this. Because deaf people can't hear. So that's actually an axiom that I teach my students all the time. I say, the one important thing you need to remember is that deaf people can't hear. And they all laugh, and then half a semester later they go, hey, you know what? Deaf people can't hear. <laughs> that's right. You can figure that out if you're going to be an interpreter. <laughs> so all of the things that motivate them have nothing to do with sound. It has to be something visual that's going to motivate them. But one mouth movement for two hand shapes is very motivating to make you change. If, if you're going to have to match, it's much easier to do one to one. So here's what it looks like. And actually, Guatemalan Sign Language puts it in their vocabulary. You can, um, there's a book on that lists a bunch of different finger spelled alphabets um, by Simon Carmel. And that particular book mentions Guatemalan Sign Language, and it's the only one that actually calls out CH as its own, and it looks like this. Which I find fascinating because it's actually quite similar to this. It's a movement structure similar to this. I, I thought that was very interesting. Okay, now I'll let you see it. Look, look at CH. So that's E N R I. C-H-M-E-N-T. One more time so you can see it. So you know I'm not making this up. C-H. So the C-H went like this. It did not go like this, C-H, which you also still find in the language. You know, there are users who still go C-H. But this guy goes C-H, uh, as well as many others. Okay, now, here's another uh, set of interesting things. So, not only do we have more because we're talking about allophones and phonemes, but now we're, we have more because we're inventing more things in the language. So, this is W-I-L-L, -L, but that the things I'm, oh, and then it'll do it over and over again, but the things that I'm pointing out in red, uh, or, okay, don't do it over and over again. Okay, one more time. See that handshake looks like this. This is an L and an I at the same time. Well, it's also a gesture that means I love you, but he's not saying, William Willard, W-I, I love you, A-R-D. <laughs> but I understand what you're saying. Um, that's an interesting situation where you have, um, right, exactly, it happens all over. <laughs> Um, so, in this case, I have a problem because this is not the same idea as coarticulation. Coarticulation spoken language is where you have two sounds that are butting up against each other so much, you're changing the, both of the sounds so that they come out as one thing. But, or they seem to be um, one thing. This is different because we're talking about the salient features of two discrete words that can be seen in their entirety in a pristine form, both at the same time. It's something that a voice cannot accomplish. So I, I had to come up with a new word for this for that reason. Now, I was, I, last night I was thinking, you know, I'm in a room full of people that are probably way smarter than me, and I don't mean probably, you are. 
I saw your presentations yesterday, and some of you are just you know, geniuses. So all I have to say is you help me, because honestly, um, if there's another concept here that I'm missing, I'd be very happy to get feedback from you to discuss it. But from what I can see, this is substantially different from uh, core articulation. Anyway, we have about 40 of these so far that um, I've been working with students that are research assistants, and I have seven that are working with me, and this is a huge project. So um, we've been able to find about 40 of these. A lot of them have to do with I. I'll show you uh, one again in the, in the, this is an M, regular old M, and this is a regular old I. Notice where my thumb is for the I. But the salient feature of I is the pinky being raised. And for the salient feature of M, it's the three fingers. Now also, um, there is a medial M and high M. So you have high M, medial, medial M, and regular citation form of M. Okay, so those are M's. Now we have this new thing called MI as a cinema that looks like this. So it puts the thumb under, but it raises the pinky. And it puts, you can have M like this or like this. So you can have this thing occurring um, in a variety of ways. So automatically I get three as soon as one appears. I'm going to assume that there are probably three out there because I can have three positions at the end. And we come to find that when we look for it, we find all three. And this is true for Varao. Uh, sorry, I left um, something off there, but um, it works for IB, which is interesting. That's what it looks like. So in this case, someone could argue that we're not actually dealing with the entire form of B, because the, the entire form of B looks like this, and we're subtracting one to make the I. So you can argue that's fine. And C is the same, it looks like this. And D is really interesting, it often looks like this or this. And then E looks like this. Again, you have to take one away. <coughs> And then N looks like this, and it can go all three positions of N, and so on. So we already talked about X. Here's a new one, D. We call this Tim D because it, it uses the thumb, index, and middle finger, and it doesn't use the other two fingers. I've been finding that these three, um, these two fingers and the thumb are the workhorses of finger spelling, and these other two just kind of sit around most of the time. And anything you can make that uses these two, except I, you often um, can make without them. So um, let's take a look at this. So you see a, a chart that shows a few more examples of how this all works. The other ones were duplicative, so uh, this is how many C's we found already. Isn't that interesting? And the C2 here is really interesting. There's also a C1 we found. Looks like this. C2 and C3. It's surprisingly interestingly similar to this handshake. <laughs> so maybe he was just trying to fingerspell. Poor guy. So this is a C that often occurs after an N, for example. So we've been finding a lot of E's among, among other things. So getting close to the end of my presentation, I just want to recap what's happening. There's a lot more than 26. We found 200 so far, approximately, and I think there's probably another 150, maybe another 200 to go. So that means individual items from an alphabet that are expressed. We're talking about a huge alphabet, but that's because it's an entirely complex system that all started from something that someone created. Isn't that really cool to think about? So um, we have cinemorphs, we have um, alphons of phonemes, we have um, and new words in the language. So one thing I, I was thinking about how this applies to other conlangs, and uh, the fact is that if you can follow the phonetic system um, of a netlang, it's it may be that some of the words that you use in your conlang transpose themselves into that language somehow. 
Um, or another way is that they'll be borrowed and um, they won't be pronounced correctly in your common language, but um, they will be pronounced correctly in the noun. Um, and if it fills a gap in the language in some way, like if it's a word that um, doesn't exist in English, for example, let's say we're talking about English, then you have a better chance of that word actually coming up uh, and appearing in use. Um, and of course, things are going to change big time over time. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time. And Question, but that is one thing. And in the 
the alphabet that they've learned, you have to do two things, a C and an H. But it seems much more logical to, uh, actually to me this is a logical change in the language, to make one thing one thing. So you go from two things to one. And so you just make that a C2 and just rotate your wrist. And that's one movement. And many signs actually have that where you have two locations and a movement in between them. But it's also supplemented by the shape of your mouth. When I have seen people fingerspell um, when they're translating, they're interpreting, they will, they will mouth. They will often do that, but I can very easily uh, find hundreds of examples for you of deaf people and hearing people who fingerspell without ever moving their mouth. And what would be interesting <laughs> is to find examples of CH where the person is not moving their mouth. Yeah. Um, the new CH. So um, I'm just interjecting a comment here. It seems actually uh, uh, the most obvious analog is uh, in writing. Exactly. I would think a, a, a good word would be a ligature. I was thinking the same thing with ligature. Right. But I think that first question back to I was thinking of handwriting, that uh, when you're writing, uh, it depends on the letter that proceeds. So, so people have lots of uh, sign words or, or allophones in your handwriting when you're writing quickly. Right. And we still can read it. Right. We can read it. We don't read now, I, I'm using the term allophone, but I'm wondering actually that many of these are actually more than an allophone, more than just an expression of the same idea, but actually in use, uh, categorically different for the user. In other words, that, that this, and, uh, this E2 is actually something that they know and use purposefully every time it comes after an N, not just it happens to occur. Um, because of, uh, what's that? In a written form, that would be a literature. But the fact is, this isn't written and it isn't spoken. So, uh, but then you call them allophones, which only find a sonic sound world. Well, what I'm, what I'm doing there is I'm actually, um, sound language linguistics takes a broader picture of that concept. And we say that it's a unit. It's not actually a sound unit. It's the smallest unit without meaning. Just to say, I just want to let you know, there are a lot of questions right now. So I mean, we got to try okay. to get to the order later. So I'm, I'm trying to go in order. Okay, thanks. Okay, David kind of stole a root out of my question. But um, you, you talked about uh, phonemes and alphones. Uh, there's also a lot of research into what has happened historically in world writing systems as writing changes over the years. and you are not necessarily talking about something in three-dimensional space there, but you're talking about something in two-dimensional space. And it seems to me you have a lot of similar issues. So you've got the issues of simplification, you've got the issues of context where a sign will change based on other signs it's next to and so forth. So have you done any research on comparing finger spelling with no, not at all, actually, because American Sign Language doesn't have a written form. So um, it would be an interesting study, I have to agree. But because but it, it doesn't is a have form of writing, really. No, it isn't a form of writing, because you can save a form of writing and look at it a hundred years later, right? But you can't do that with American Sign Language. It's, it's for the moment. And once it's gone, other than now, we can, we can capture a video, which is changing the world, frankly. Um, now, uh, PhD programs that teach deaf people are figuring out ways that you can put citations on videos and letting students do PhD uh, dissertations in ASL. Isn't that great? I'm sorry, I shouldn't be pointing. Somebody with a microphone. Yeah, and um, just taking care of it. Uh, two questions from IRC. Uh, Gustav asks if you could briefly talk about how uh, finger spelling combinations get lexicalized. Uh, and, um, George Corley asks whether there are sign language that didn't arise from a written tradition or arose in illiterate society uh, where uh, hand shapes or finger spelling might not have uh, a correspondence to written forms. Very good. Actually, I don't know that the, uh, the hand, in the second question first, I don't know that the hand shapes or the signs actually, because they're more than just a hand shape, they contain all the parameters of the sign. Um, I don't know that those actually represent uh, a written form. They actually, uh, they, re they represent uh, 
originally a construct in someone's mind, uh, this Yebra, who was trying to remember a prayer. So whatever he was thinking of related to that A um, was what he decided was going to be uh, the thing, the mnemonic for that. Um, so it wasn't as though it was trying to represent the written form. Now we do have some that clearly, like L, um, I mean, no one can deny this, right? I mean, that's an L, right? You can write it down, it, it looks like an L. Sure, I, I agree, but there are not very many of those in ASL. So um, that's one interesting issue. Um, to the first point, um, first person's question, um, here's an example of a lexicalized finger spelled sign. It's the, it's the word for the place you put your money. Um, my bad. No, I mean um, <laughs> bank. Um, and do. Okay, here's, here's what I'm going to show you that was the first thing that got me interested in studying all of this. And it is this. Own. Own. O W N. As in, that's. Uh, I own that. It's, it's actually interesting that it's seldom used. But here's what it was, here it was, is how it was used by Bernard Bragg, who's a fairly famous, in, the, in my world, uh, older deaf person who was in mine, and he did this. He spelled clown, and he did CL, and then he used the lexicalized word own. So he did CL and then own which made me think, does that mean that all lexicalized forms are owned by deaf people and then they can just implement them anywhere they want whenever they're using finger spelling? Because that was interesting to me and I found that it's true. Double Z, S from pizza, the sign for pizza looks like this now. And that's where double Z came from, I believe. I can't prove that yet, but I believe it came from pizza. Because um, before World War II it didn't exist. And after World War II, you can see a steady um, change in, in, in about the 70s. Um, it was used more and more, and now it's ubiquitous. So that's uh, both of those questions. You know, um, I don't know if this is useful or not, but it occurred to me that when you're talking about things like the extended PE the eye and so forth, if you think of um, just the extension of the pinky as the meaningful feature there, right? Because the other fingers are not. Right, I call it a salient feature, but yes. These, um, the techniques used in auto-segmental phonology for mapping multiple features on the timing slots might be handy for talking about this kind of thing because you, you can think of the one gesture as a single timing slot and then as well, how many features can fit in that slot before they start interfering with each other? Exactly. Now that would be interesting, you're right. So I actually have two questions. The first one that I think will be pretty easy to answer. Um, and that's the MI together, like this. Can you also have that for IM? Can it go by directional, or are these? I'll show you how it would work. Um, generally, if you would go IM, you're, you're reducing, you're lowering the pinky to get to M. Okay. But if it's MI, um, the M stays, and you add the I, so it becomes M and then M. Now, this also has another function, I believe, in ASL, and that's because it's so fast. We need redundancy for you to be able to see what's going on because you blink every three to five seconds. And the blink takes um, what I call a frame. It takes three to 11 frames to blink. And a frame is 30, 30 frames per, at 30 frames a second. So you, you're dealing with a muscular system uh, that has to continually wet the eyes and blink. Therefore, there has to be some redundancy in finger spelling, or we're lost. Um, we'll never understand anything. So this actually is very helpful um, in the sense that now we're, we're keeping the M a little longer. So now we can figure out if it's MI, then, then, and it only goes in one direction and not both ways, then it's a little more clear. However, IC works in both directions. So it's a little confusing. And then also with, because you said with the R, this is the hardest angle to see straight front. Right, because there's less in there. Do you find that a lot at the ends of words? Because it's like, okay, by the end you can almost guess what's going to come next. And so, or is that more perhaps based on what science is coming next? This could be assimilation. Yeah, it often is assimilation. 
moving away from furious white space often just because of the simulation. Okay, um, and we have to call to a close. If you have more questions, you can always find the uh, gym players. Thank you so much. Thank you.